Okay, hello and welcome back to the Land Rover Toolbox videos once again and we're continuing with the Land Rover specific welding. So in this episode we want to start planning exactly how we're going to uh, replace a spring mount and the joints and the welding techniques that are needed to be able to be successful with this. So one of the basic welds will be a fillet weld, uh, horizontal or vertical or flat, and the other will be an edge weld. So one thing with inverter welders, AC and DC welding, you've got to remember that you have uh, electro positive or electro negative. Now I've marked these as a handy little tip. And this DINS plug, which is what it's called, um, is marked so I know where the electrode is, whether it's on the negative or positive when I'm welding DC. This weld is actually uh, slightly different from the other weld I'm using. You can hear that the AC has a certain buzz to it. Now this is just with this particular welder. And with the DC, I've set this on 110 compared to 130 for 3.25 welding stick. And uh, if you listen carefully, you can hear that the, the weld itself is a lot softer. DC welds it differently to an AC current. In a previous video, I suggested that if you're going to practice, first of all, uh, on the flat is to get some beads laid down. And I suggested that there is a certain rod angle for the electrode. Now what I want to show you here, I'm just going to um, open this out a little bit. I have two slightly different welds here. One's flat and one's more raised. Now these are two different uh, angles. Now I'm going to explain this because this is actually quite important as you get control more of your electrode. Right, this one itself is fairly flat. This one is crowned or it's a lot higher. And this depends on the angle of the welding rod. Now, this is almost perpendicular, which you need to have really because that is where you get most of the heat. Okay, now if you lean it over, the weld becomes colder and it stacks up the weld higher, as you can see here. And it's just something to remember because you will at some point actually need to use that technique. So on to our uh, Defender and Discovery chassis. This area, especially on Defenders and Discoveries, uh, tends to rot out, and so does this. And this is mainly on the 110s. This is on the outside and on the inside of the chassis rails. Okay, I'm not actually going to cut and weld this, so I can show you how to do it in a different area, which I need to do. So what I have here is the top mount of the uh, spring, and it's rotten here. And what I'm going to do is make a cut here and make a cut here. I'm going to remove a par portion of the chassis rail along with this. And then I'm also going to remove a part of this section here and then on this side. And this will give you a practical insight into how to do most of your chassis rails. Okay, so planning cuts are really important. And when I cut the chassis, I took four cuts and the chassis rail was cut in half with one of these discs and one mill. So planning the cut on this, quite easy, is I'll show you here, that's one cut. There's the second cut upwards, third, fourth, and then along the back here, fifth, and then along the seam along here, sixth, and the whole lot can come off in one go, quite easy. The whole aim of this really is to save on materials, cutting discs and electricity of course. Obviously some people's options would be to gas the hell out of it, however we don't have oxycetylene here, all we have are 1mm slitting discs which are um, good enough. Okay, so um, I'm going to actually butt weld it, I'm not going to patch it, I'm going to butt weld it which means joining it or the steel like this. Basically, it is a uh, recognized technique, so it is hiding the weld. But what we need to do is to make sure that we can grind the weld off and still have enough weld in there which is penetrated. So I'm just going to draw you out a diagram on here, which actually, to be honest with you, you can't see very well. So I'll just turn this over, start again. Okay, so butt welding. What we need to do, we have two pieces of metal uh, edge to edge. And then basically I need to be able to cut off 30 degrees a portion of each of the edges which will allow me to get more penetration into the steel. 
OK, so if we're welding in this area here, filling this up with weld, it's going to penetrate and have a joint which will be fairly decent enough and will have the right strength. OK, so this I will have to find a way of cutting it out. So this whole portion will disappear and so will the spring uh, top mount itself. We do have one and hopefully this is the correct one for the 110 springs. Right, so the uh, chassis rail will, on your Land Rover, have a seam along here. And this is because there's two sections welded together. This one is not, this one is welded in a different way. You can see on the edge, it has an edge weld. And that's two pieces that are basically jointed together like this. So we're looking at using this type of a joint on the chassis here. The uh, bump stop also has um, edge welding, you can see that here, that's done at a lower voltage. And of course we have a fillet welds. Now these welds are, well, they're not awkward to do. Um, just the fillet weld, as I'll show you here, is the same thickness as the steel that you're actually welding. So you can see I've got a 5mm piece of steel that covers the weld just nicely. And uh, this weld is what I did earlier on that 5mm plate steel, as you can see. You'll also notice that this will be fillet welded on both sides. Last but not least, I forgot to mention this earlier, is the uh, lap joint. And basically, it is a joint which uh, two bits of metal are lapped over and then welded as such. There's something you have to observe here because the bottom plate will absorb more heat than the top plate because you're actually welding. You've got more of an area for heat absorption. OK, so I've tacked it and I'm just going to show you here where the rod motion would be, you'd start on the bottom plate with a, an angle like such with your electrode. And what you're doing is you're working in to the top plate edge, okay? So the heat will remain on the bottom plate and it's almost like you're uh, sweeping leaves up onto a curb, as it were. And this is the sort of action you'll have. If you get too far and a bit too excited, you can get something called undercutting, which looks like this, which is not very pretty. And it shows actually that there's possibly a little bit too much amperage used. But this is a uh, example I did earlier. Okay, I've got a few other things to show you. And uh, one of these is uh, when you have a slag inclusion, and uh, you weld over it without grinding it out. What happens is you get something called porosity. And this is, well, any impurities can push through your weld, destroy your weld, and you'll see it in the slag itself on the top. You can see the holes. I'll just put the light on there. And you see the holes where the gas has escaped. Now, bad welding is because of preparation mainly or uh, over amperage or impurities. This also happens when you have uh, the arc too long. This case I showed you there was slag under there and I welded straight over it. It's not a pretty sight and you know underneath the weld is going to be fairly poor. So what I'll do is I'll chip this off now with the uh, old slag hammer. And I'll show you what's actually happened because we have uh, the same type of weld to be honest with you because the slag has not moved, it hasn't been welded out, it's just trapped in there. You can see that by the hole just here. So it's something to watch out for. And the ideal thing, of course, is to grind that out and then re-weld it without any a slag underneath it. I know we all come to want to rush, but this is what you should be aiming for. And then just run a bead again. Right, so what we have is a corner joint. And basically, it's a 45 degree angle. Both of these areas will actually... Um, overheat because the heat spread is not going to be brilliant so what I did here I used a 2.5 rod on 65 or 70 amps I can't remember now let's say 60 amps filled it up it's okay it's it's fine but it hasn't penetrated all the way through believe it or not so what I'm going to do here is a quick demo and weld this 5 mil plate at a lower amperage which will be a 3.25 rod at 95 amps so this should be good enough to get good penetration and you can see here i'm basically welding but i've uh, my usual habit is to build the weld up quite high and have a crown on it so 
the angle is angled quite well. So I also have an Achilles heel, and you'll see this here. Okay, um, I dawdled a little bit too long in this area, and uh, basically I burnt the corner. So what I'm going to do, uh, that means melding it out. Basically what I'm going to do is use the grinder, grind it out, and then just stick another weld on it. And I'll tell you now, this wasn't actually very successful, as you'll see. But basically if you screw up a weld, and we all do it, grind it back and then do it again and there's nothing wrong with using a grinder this is something that you're going to have to get out of your head you want good penetration and the weld to look good so i'll just quickly uh, chuck this on here and uh, yeah it didn't work I'll, this is one of my achilles heels which in next week's episode you'll probably see that i've cured this i'll have a little bit more practice and see where i've gone wrong and then i'll show you Anywho, nobody's perfect. Right, so you can see the weld has actually come all the way through here, and I would be happy. Uh, the amperage that it's welded at, that this is a strong weld. Basically, welders will always argue which amperage is the best, so you have to find the best that is good enough for you. A smaller rod, which is 2.5, it wasn't penetrated right the way through, so it needs attacking on the back end. Now, the other thing here, you can see the thickness of weld is different, and I did lean the rod back a bit more, so I got more of a crown on this. But you can see the difference between using different rods, and that there are no hard and fast rules. You find out what is the best for you. I'll just tell you that I'm still using a 6013 rod which works in all positions and in AC, DCEN and DCEP. This is considered a filler rod rather than a fast freeze rod. And watch the weld pull here. You can see that it takes its time to solidify under the slag. I've also found with the machine that 110 amps on DCEN is perfect for how I feel that I should be welding, which is my own personal preference with a 3.25 rod.